Okay. Uh, what's up, everyone? Goldie here. Uh, happy Tuesday. Um, let's continue chugging along with the first week of the season. Uh, big 11 gamer here on the main today. Um, we are only missing a, a starter for Baltimore due to Kyle Bradish getting hit in the foot slash ankle slash something last night and leaving early. Um, Tyler Wells was slated to start today, uh, but he had to come in and eat a bunch of innings last night uh, for Bradish. So don't have anything yet from Baltimore. Um, so we'll see what they want to do. Uh, it's probably going to be a bullpen day for for Baltimore. Um, they're not going to want to rush any of their top of the rotation guys uh, you know, on four days at the first week of the season or anything like that. So probably a bullpen day, but we'll see what they want to do uh, later on in the day. We'll have projection updates. Um, as of right now, we do have them... Uh, look, we do have them uh, here in the sheet and pushed to the site already. Um, so we're we're getting to now what a week in, into the season we're getting back to the uh, um, top end of the rotation for a couple of these teams, notably the Mets and Max Scherzer, uh, Cleveland and Bieber. Uh, Herman Marquez is starting again for the Rockies. Um, Framber, of course, is getting Detroit today, and we could see a big freaking ownership number on him already coming in. So um, a, a good mixture here of arms on the mound, and I think some, yet again, some attackable spots. You didn't have to go with Mega Chalk yesterday, even though you probably got there with the Pittsburgh and Boston game, but Kirby was not good. Uh, talked about coming in under weight on him, uh, and that's because he his his secondary stuff is just not good enough um, when he's piping the fastball, and that's kind of what was happening to him happening to him last night. So um, that's really also Hunter Brown yesterday for uh, for the Astros was very popular as well. Um, now we're not really running into the same sort of Issue with Framber. Framber is markedly uh, better than both George Kirby and Hunter Brown. So, um, you know, you could be convinced a lot easier to eat this type of ownership on a starting pitcher, but um, that is just sort of an illustration as to why we can pivot a lot of the time. You don't have to just play chalk because they're chalk, and there's opportunity cost of fading a chalk pitcher. There definitely is, but it reaches a point where you start taking more risk than is warranted because there is so much variance in baseball. So, um, you know, that said, you can eat chalk for sure. And this is really what sort of separates baseball from a lot of the other sports where eating chalk is just kind of mandatory. Um, guys are chalk for a reason and they're more likely to perform very well uh, when they're chalk at other sports, but in baseball, season is so long, the projections are more of a a loose guideline than um, than perhaps in in some of the other sports that we play, because there's so much variance and the season's so long. So um, you really need to be getting contrarian where you can, because when you're eating a 50% ownership on a guy, it, it doesn't take a whole hell of a lot for that to be a suboptimal play. Um, certainly, a couple of days ago with like Jeff Springs or something, uh, you needed it because it put a 40 or, or whatever it was. Um, so it, it it will come through sometimes, as will chalk stacks and, and all that kind of jazz, right? But... Um, in general, it's not a, a very equitable route to uh, just play every every chalk play, um, you know, like they're a, a, a chalk running back or, or something in football uh, at 3,200 or something getting 26 carries. Um, totally different animal here in baseball. So um, embrace the variance, guys. That's how you 
win tournaments, and that's how you are profitable in baseball. Um, you can play cash and play all the chalk guys all you want, but uh, in tournaments, you, you really are kind of required to get off the board a little bit and, and embrace some of the uncertainty here. So um, that little spiel aside, uh, we can just get into some of the games here. Uh, a lot of guys continuing their series that they started yesterday. Um, I guess pretty much everybody. A couple afternoon games. Uh, we're not going to get the Reds and the Cubs, nor are we going to get the... Let's just bring these guys up here. Nor are we going to get the uh, Marlins and the Twins once again. Um, here's that sort of early 640 nonsense that they're they're screwing around with. Um, so missing these couple of teams, but a full 11 gamer nonetheless, and, and plenty of stuff to target. So let's just get into the games. Um, okay. Let's see, right off the top, Philly and the Yankees once again. Matt Strom on the now on the mound for the Phillies. Uh, rough start here for the Phillies, man. You know they, they got bludgeoned again yesterday. Taiwan Walker got beat up a little bit, and Yankees are fine. Yankees just doing Yankees things, hitting the ball over the wall like uh, you know all they got to do is hit it 310 feet, and um, you know they score six runs. So. Uh, Matt Strom here at 5,500 coming over from the Padres. Um, Strom's got okay stuff. He's got a good four-seamer sinker combo. Uh, it's workable in the arsenal. And he's got some breaking stuff that uh, allows him to maneuver into some counts as well. But for the most part, came out of the bullpen. I mean, for the most part, for the entire part. Came out of the bullpen last year uh, for the Padres. So he's got a change up, but... It's not very good. Uh, doesn't use it a whole hell of a lot, uh, but he's got these other four pitches. Doesn't need to use it a, a ton necessarily. But uh, if he's going to be eating innings in the rotation, once again, mention, um, you know, the early part of the season here, teams are really just starting to feel out their rotations or continuing to. Um, and, I mean, you know, really just suffice to say that we don't, want to be screwing around with a left-hander in Yankee Stadium um, against the, the Yankees down here. They've got 28 righties that they could throw at you, and every one of them has power. Um, and the stadium itself uh, is tiny, so uh, we don't want to be jacking around with Matt Strom here. Um, his suppression metrics are fine, but we're not sure how deep he's really going to go into the into the game here for the Phillies. So um, not a whole lot in the way of attackability in the numbers, but once again, this is mostly bullpen stuff, and he's a you know, he's a lefty that came out of the bullpen, so it was mostly specialized uh, type of work last season. Um, big K stuff, and like I said, a workable four pitch arsenal here. So if we do hear that he's going to uh, be fully stretched out and um, you know, will have a, a full workload ahead of him, then he is not the worst play in the world to land on at 5,500 uh, because the Yankees are a little bit susceptible to velocity and, and mixing up counts here, but uh, or mixing up y your pitch arsenal. But uh, really not something I want to go out of my way to target for sure. Uh, Domingo Harmon on the other side for the Yankees, um, getting the Phillies – Pretty rare that we're going to be playing Domingo Herman. Um, at least me. I just don't like playing the guy. He, he's going to pop occasionally, but for the most part, he is overpriced for his upside. A lot of the time, he's he's more of just a pitcher uh, rather than a DFS pitcher and a strike thrower or a strikeout pitcher rather. Um, he throws strike one and and doesn't walk people, so that really keeps him out of trouble for the most part. At a neutral ground ball to fly ball, it's a little dangerous going after that kind of batted ball profile in Yankee Stadium. So at 7,700, I'm not wild about this. This projection uh, in the early runs here looks about accurate to me because he's only got a 20% strikeout rate. As I mentioned, doesn't walk people with a buck 16 whip. The swinging strike and CSW rates are fine. Really nothing to speak of um, in, in terms of 
power necessarily, but a little bit of susceptibility to both sides, not really in the average department or in the WOBA necessarily because, it, once again, the walk rate is low. But he will give up some extra base hits, 170 ISO to lefties and 193 ISO to righties last season. Markedly lower strikeout rate to the left side of the plate, just 15% compared to the 24% against same-handed hitters and, and righties. So um, if we are going to attack, attack him, it's going to be with, with left-handed hitters, and we like doing that in Yankee Stadium. He has an 060 ground ball to fly ball ratio. That, that's a pretty alarming number for a righty at, at Yankee Stadium in a you know, very small yard here. So um, that puts us into Kyle Schwarber territory for sure. He's 5,500. Uh, really attackable price tag here for Schwarber. Uh, we could also get to some Derek Hall if you want to. I mean, Trey Turner hits righties. You know, perfectly fine. Um, we'll strike out a little bit. JTR probably not going to strike out. And 4,900 bit stiff here maybe. So I I like getting to probably just one-offs for the most part of Kyle Schwarber, Derek Hall. You could stack the Phillies because they're going to bounce eventually and they're going to put up a crooked number. And it could very well come against Domingo Herman. He's not going to blow it by them. And overall, the the you know the top couple of guys at the at uh, the lineup here for the Phillies, Trey and, and Schwarber, they're going to strike out. But once Harper gets back, it's going to make this lineup uh, very, very dangerous and difficult to attack in general. So don't don't be surprised if, if the Phillies start to bounce here a little bit. Um, you know, they're not going to lose 162, I'll tell you that much. So uh, it's an attackable spot against Bingo here. He will give up some power and some balls in the air. Okay, moving on, Tampa and Washington. Tampa was pretty disappointing yesterday. Uh, they were they ended up being really chalky when they weren't so much so early in the day. Uh, Rasmussen was fantastic. He got yanked after 66 pitches, I believe, in six innings. Uh, he was excellent. Um, so the starting rotation from the Rays has been a, a really great to, to start the season here. Probably not going to be able to attack Washington with the same sort of um, aggression that we did yesterday with Josh Fleming here. 17% strikeout rate, mostly a bullpen arm coming out of the pen yet, uh, last season, and r really nothing to speak of in terms of a workable arsenal. So he's going to be uh, attackable. You could actually consider getting to some of the Nationals here. Joey Manessis for sure at 4600 This is a good price tag, and this is a high upside spot for him because... Josh Fleming, even coming out of the bullpen um, with some perhaps a little bit noisy numbers with a small sample, like it, he's going to throw it over the plate and pitch to a lot of contact, and that means with a bad changeup that he throws a full 20% of the time, really, really negative value, he's going to give up a lot of power. Full 258 ISO with a 386 average allowed to 462 Woba to righties, just a 12% strikeout rate, 2.1 homers per nine last season for Fleming. Um now, Washington, the ballpark's going to play up righty power a little bit more than it will lefty power. Uh, we do, I do still have, of course, you know, the weather to worry about early in the season. When it really warms up, uh, Washington plays like Yankee Stadium a lot of the time. So um, something to keep in mind going forward. But nevertheless, even early here in the season, we can get after some Josh Fleming. Um, I would probably stay off of Jamer. He just strikes out so freaking much. But he's in the three-hole at 2,900. Not the worst if you're, I mean, pretty close to the worst. But he's playable in stacks. Um, Lane Thomas probably going to be leading off once again. So uh, a Lane Thomas, Joey Manessis, and maybe a Victor Robles, if you want to make it really cheap and get to, like, some double expensive pitchers or something. I think that's a reasonable construction today. Something to think about, but Joey Maness is definitely the, the favorite play from the Washington Nationals um, against uh, Josh Fleming. He's not going to strike anybody out. So probably not going to go all that deep into the game either. Uh, so you might get some, some bullpen arms uh, from the Rays as well. On the other side, Chad Cool, he stinks. Uh, he got bludgeoned last season as well. 229 ISO, 202 ISO to lefties and righties respectively. Big, big numbers. A lot of these games were in Coors Field, so perhaps slightly inflated, but 1.7 homers per nine and 1.6 homers per nine, respectively, to lefties and righties as well. You can't fake those numbers, right? So there was a lot of hard contact to the left side of the plate. We've been able to attack Chad Cool with lefties going back to his early Pittsburgh days. So 
Um, sinker is bad. Slider is serviceable, but curveball is bad and doesn't have a changeup either. So that makes it really difficult for him to navigate opposite-handed hitters. He also walks a crap load of people. 9.4% walk rate, sub-60% strike one rate. He just doesn't have any chase in him. So he can't throw it by anybody. And the you know, the high upper fours and, and low fives ERA is probably going to persist for him in the Nationals rotation this season. Full buck 55 whip. Um, we want to we want to be attacking this. So you can you can stack Tampa once again. They're going to be popular and in early runs. We are showing them all uh, at least at the top of the lineup. The guys that are most likely going to be in there once again. Uh, they're going to be popular as well. So Brandon Lau, hopefully he can not shit the bed. He did get a price drop at 3400 You're probably just going to have to go right back to it. Uh, Wander got a price bump up to 49 from 47 You can still play him. Disappointing day yesterday with, uh, I think, just a single and a stolen base. But um, don't worry about Franco here. He'll, he'll be perfectly fine. Randy, also a disappointing day. You can get to everybody. Luke Rayleigh did hit two dingers. 2300 still. Very cheap and very playable. So uh, Isak at, unfortunately, 38 got a $500 price bump today. Um, all these guys are playable because Chad Cool isn't just attackable with left-handers. You can get to him with the righties as well. As I mentioned, 202 ISO allowed and uh, no whiff stuff. He's not going to throw it past anybody and he's a fly, fly ball pitcher. So should be a, lot, a good bit of opportunity for some runs scored here in Washington today. Okay, moving on, Pittsburgh and Boston. A lot of runs scored here last night. Um, O'Neal Cruz was very disappointing. Brian Reynolds was not disappointing. He hit two dingers, and, you know, Pittsburgh would, you know, this is going to be an attackable lineup, at least from a, a playability standpoint. Um, you know, they've got some okay hitters over here and some young guys that they're giving a look to like CSN. This is Jackson Smith and Jigbo's brother. Um, Cabrian Hayes, of course, it is what third, fourth year in the league now, something like that. Uh, Jackson wincy has got a really nice swing path. Really like this kid. Uh, Jason delay as he hit a bomb last night, he's got some pop. So, uh, and of course, uh, O'Neill Cruz, G man Choi, they have, uh, against lefties. They will run out. Of course, Andrew McCutcheon, et cetera, et cetera. Carlos Santana doesn't strike out, walks a crap load. Um, so different makeup in the Pittsburgh lineup two years past. We'll get to that in a second when we talk about Pavetta. But Rowenzi Contreras on the mound for the Pirates, 6900 like this price for him. Uh, he's got good stuff. He's got a really strong fastball, a lot of gas. Uh, he'll top it out at about 97, 98, sits about 95, 96. But really, really good slider and, you know, a, a serviceable curveball. Um, it is a true curveball, so it's not really like a slurve or anything, but still throwing it pretty hard. So um, that really kind of flattens the breaking pitch. And with the slider, you can you can kind of get away with that. Not so much with the curveball. Uh has to work on a change, doesn't use it all that much, but he gives up power. And that's because the four-seamer, he's throwing over the plate a lot of the time. Um and with the lack of really good secondary stuff, that really yields a lot of power later in the count. It's not that he doesn't throw strike one. He gets ahead of hitters at you know a full 61% clip here. But a, a 10% walk rate and just a 21% aggregate strikeout rate is a little bit worrisome. And that's just because of the lack of secondary uh, pitches here. So... In the way of average allowed to both sides of the plate, nothing really too terrible here. 204, 239 to lefties and righties, but it's the power. It's the extra base hits and, and the homers that could really get to Ruenzi when he pipes the fastball. 184 ISO to lefties, 192 ISO to righties, sub eight, I mean, right at, at 18% strikeout rate uh, against left handers with an 073 ground ball to fly ball. So an aggregate 084 ground ball to fly ball. So we want to target guys that can hit the ball on the line. Uh, against Rowenzi here, and Boston, they, this lineup is definitely not this good, but they've had some pretty good matchups um, early here in the season, so you can get to Verdugo again, 4,600, it's playable just because he's leading off, you can always play Rafi, of course, at 5,900, uh, 43 for Justin Turner makes it a little bit cheaper, Masataki Yoshida finally got into a ball yesterday at 49, that's an unfortunate price bump for him, but he's still playable in another good matchup. Uh, against Contreras here. So Tristan Costa is 25. He's cheap, and he makes this stack very workable. So you can get to Boston once again uh, in 
in Fenway against an uh, inattackable arm over here in Rowenzi. 6,900 for him. Um, you could consider, because he's got gas, you could consider playing him at this price tag in general. Probably not today, however. Nick Pavetta on the other side, 8,500. Um, same, similar strikeout rate, similar stuff. Uh, better four-seamer, still just marginal relative to league average, though. And a good slider. Um, not so much on the curveball, which he's using more than the slider. Really wish he would drop this and add in a cutter because the slider is a good pitch for him. Similar pitch grips are the cutter and the slider. So wish he would drop the curveball, but... Um, you know, what do I know? Uh, 22 and a half percent aggregate strikeout rate. Also some walk problems from Pavetta and a 60 percent first pitch strike rate. So some susceptibility here for sure. Looks about uh, about right to me. The average projection right here, about 14 points or so. 10, 12 percent ownership. I don't know. Seems a little bit high out of the gate. Um, and at 8,500, I'm not super excited about tacking attacking Pittsburgh, as I mentioned, I think this is an okay lineup up there um, for the Pirates. So I don't really want to go after them with with guys that really aren't going to be able to throw it by them and are, that are going to pitch to a lot of contact like Pavetta will at a full 79% here. So just a 10% swinging strike, it's a little alarming. And a lot of hard contact coming to the right side, 37% in the pitch info, that's alarming. Doesn't really translate to extra base hits, but hard contact eventually equals extra base hits and, and power. So um, at a neutral ground ball to fly ball here, that's it, he's very attackable once again. So I think we can get to offense for sure on both sides. Um, mostly we want to attack Pavetta here with lefties. Full 199 at ISO allowed and a 1.6 homers per nine. Hard contact a little bit better and more reasonable, but the soft contact numbers to both sides are hovering, you know, 15, 16 percent. That's uh, it's that's not great. It it's not high enough. So Pavetta is definitely attackable, and I think at 8,500 he's probably just a bit overpriced for me today. So mostly offense once again in Fenway. All right, Mets and the Brewers. Scherzer on the mound, as we alluded to earlier. 10-8 for Scherzer. Y yikes. Um. This is kind of a rough matchup, it's a sneaky rough matchup, because the Brewers, they actually hit the righties the, quite a bit better than they do lefties. Um, they're, they're still going to strike out, so you can definitely play Scherzer. Uh, and, and I would play him in tournaments. In single-entry stuff, I think you could, you might be able to get away with, uh, with coming off and coming down to somebody a little bit cheaper. Um, but the Brewers you know, are, are a little bit worse against lefties than they are against righties, so... Um, that doesn't really matter all that, all that much. So this is Scherzer and, and a projection of 20 here and an ownership of about 24, 25% seems about fine and, and right at value. Don't think there's anything attackable, at least here in the early runs in terms of those numbers. Um, Scherzer is always one of the top arms, so you can always play him, but I would be, he does have a home run problem, right? And that's how they... Like, he's on the barrel a little bit at 8.5%. That is an elevated rate. It's one of the worst or higher numbers in the league, certainly for a guy that's got a 30% strikeout rate. So that is worrisome a little bit for Scherzer when he... And it's mostly the lefties. He's elite against right-handers, so you don't want to touch a righty against him in general. Um, but the Brewers, they're going to be able to platoon a good bit here with Yelich, Winker, Rowdy Telez, Garrett Mitchell hits from the left side, Bryce Terang has had a... Uh, an excellent start to the season um, as well. Top prospect, as is uh, Joey Weimer down here, but he hits from the right side, so probably not going to be targeting him. But some some lefties for sure that we can go after Scherzer with if you want to hedge some of this ownership, certainly if it steams later on in the day. Um, you know, but don't shy away from him. Get a, a healthy amount of Scherzer wherever you're playing. You can play him in single entry and three max. You don't have to play him in single entry and three max because of the elevated price tag and the homer issues. Uh, the Brewers last season hit a crap load of, of dingers, and that's how they scored most of their runs. So a dangerous team over here to a guy that is susceptible um, to giving up balls in the air. Uh for the Brewers on the other side, uh, Wade Miley on the mound, um, crafty lefty Wade Miley in his 48th season in the big leagues here, uh, 8,100, not a lot of value to squeeze out of this price here at 10, 12 point projection and no ownership. This all seems, uh, all seems correct to me. He's throwing the entire kitchen sink here 
um, with a full five and even six pitch mix. He has really come off of the sinker that he used to throw earlier in his career, moved to the cutter, which has really extended his career. But he's still not striking anybody out and still has a markedly um, notable ground ball to fly ball ratio, getting a lot of ground balls, still pitching to a good bit of contact um, and not throwing it by people. 17.5% aggregate strikeout rate, a little bit worrisome in the, in the walk department. That's because he's throwing so many damn pitches, but he's still suppressing runs and suppressing production at a pretty re uh, respectable rate. So how do we want to go after Wade Miley? Um, he was hurt a lot of, of last year, but really not a lot has changed in his arsenal uh, at this point of his career. Um, he was never overly susceptible to right-handed power um, and was always pretty pretty good against lefties anyway. So we don't have a large sample here because he didn't get all that much work last season. But uh, you can get to the Mets for sure. Um, they don't strike out against, uh, against lefties, and that's not going to persist, uh, or that will persist rather. Uh, against lefties this season, and here we are. We have them at just a, a, a sub-20% strikeout rate created at a 110 clip last season. Buck 51 ISO, so still a little bit frustrating to stack the Mets. Um, you know, they they should probably hit for a, a lot more power than they do, but this, is, this lineup is really constructed um, in an old-school type of baseball kind of way, and, and that's it, it get runners on, get them over, and then get them in. Uh, with sack flies, they don't bunt a lot, but I, I mean, it's not to say they don't have power. Of course, Pete Alonso, Starling Marte, they've got some pop. Um, Mark has got a little bit of pop. Tommy Pham, they're probably going to lead off here today instead of Brandon Nimmo. Uh, he's got some pop. So all of these guys at playable price tags, you can stack the Mets and and hope Wade Miley just kind of, you know, when he's bad, he'll he'll float some of the uh, the change up in the in the slider a little bit. Fastball is always, you know, usually pretty good, mostly relying once again on the cutter. So if if any of these one, any of these pitches are that he really relies on the cutter and the change are uh, subpar uh, and and really just doesn't have the the control, starts walking people a little bit. This could get out of hand in a hurry with the type of lineup construction that the Mets bring to the table over here. So you can get to some offense here, um, and and definitely play Scherzer. or you know you don't have to outright fade him and stack the Brewers or anything crazy, but. Um, just be aware that at 10-8, at you're assuming a, a little bit of a risk here. Okay, Toronto and Kansas City. Hopefully Toronto, and, and today's the day, they're probably going to be pretty popular um, for them to kind of break out. And and I think against Bubic, it, it's probably a pretty damn good uh, spot for them. We'll get to him in a minute. Yusei Kikuchi on the, on the mound for the Jays. 6700 this is a good price for him. Um, I really don't... Like, he was so bad last year. Like, the unbelievable how much power he gave up to the right side of the plate in a huge sample. 76 innings, 355 hitters that he saw, 256 average allowed, 390 Woba, 279 ISO, 28% strikeout rate, but a 14% walkout rate, full 2.5 homers per nine, a 43% hard contact rate to the right side. Those are miserable numbers. And there's nothing to suggest yet that um, he's really figured it out. Admittedly, last season, I mean, I'm not sure if this is totally true, he was dealing with a little bit of a neck issue. So that could have um, could have jacked up the mechanics a little. But the the issue for, uh, the, you know, the injury news didn't come out for Yusei Kikuchi until about six starts in uh, after he'd just been getting bludgeoned by right-handers. So who knows if that was true. In any case... Um, this is like you had a bad four seamer last year. He tried mixing in the cutter. That was bad. The only serviceable pitch was a a change up, but it didn't matter because the slider was awful too. And you know he just can't throw a change up 100% of the time. That means it's a fastball, right? So with a bad fastball, bad breaking stuff, the uh, the good off speed stuff doesn't really matter, and you're not going to be able to neutralize power to the other side of the plate. Uh, to your handedness. So he was on the barrel at a 15% clip. This is by far the highest and worst number in baseball uh, last year for a guy that, that threw 100 freaking innings. I mean, this is a lot. So you can you can attack him once again, uh, just like we attacked Josie Barrios uh, with lefties. You can attack Kikuchi one, still with, uh, with righties. And until uh, these guys prove to me that they have figured it out, we're going to go after him. That said... Uh, 
with the strikeout rate of 27%, he can still throw it by some people, and the Royals are going to strike out a little bit. Um, you know, last year they didn't, but in the early going here this season, uh, definitely some swing and miss still. So you should probably see Salvi back in the lineup today. Just got a day off yesterday, I believe. Bobby Witt got into his first ball yesterday. Still probably generally overpriced at 49, but um, a lot of the stolen base upside is kind of priced in here. And unfortunately, the the cheaper guys that we'd really like to get to, like a Vinny Pascantino, Michael Massey, they hit from the left side. So um, we don't really want to go after Kikuchi with lefties, but playing some of these guys in stacks is per is perfectly acceptable as well. Buck 51 ISO uh, is still notable um, with an elevated 35% hard contact rate to to that side as well. So uh, all of these guys are playable for the Royals once again and. Um, I'm probably going to go broke stack in Kansas City, as I have literally for the last like six years. Um, they're very frustrating because the matchups are always great and they always just get blasted. So, um, you know, I guess that's on me, right? So in any case, you can stack the Royals again and don't be surprised if Kikuchi just hasn't figured it out because he was so, so bad. Um, he's going to have to completely retool the arsenal and the mechanics to fix all of that. On the other side, Chris Bubich, 6,500 on the mound here. Uh, can't You just can't touch him. Only has 19% strikeout rate and threw a lot of innings last year, 129 for a young arm, but really couldn't suppress anything. Five five and a half ERA with a four and a half XFIP. Uh, it's no good. Uh, buck 70 whip, that's because he's got a 60%, sub 60% uh, first pitch strike rate and 11% walk rate, and he throws to 80% contact rate. All numbers all way, way, way too high. Hard contact to lefties, as a matter of fact, markedly higher than it is to righties, but both of these numbers uh, well over 30% and alarming nevertheless. A little bit noisy, 26 and a third inning sample. So the power numbers that he exhibited to left-handers last year, 372 average, 457 WOBA, 239 ISO allowed. Uh, very alarming, but perhaps a bit noisy. 2.1 homers per nine. That's going to come down, but uh, it, it's just naturally not sustainable for a same-handed, um, or for a split, rather, against same-handed hitters. But with a bad fastball, if you're just piping it at 92 miles an hour, uh, there are high school teams that can that are going to blast you at 92. So, um, you know, this is very, very dangerous. And against Toronto, this could be the spot where they finally break out today. Uh, it's going to be them and... Tampa probably leading the way in the ownership, but you could play literally everyone. Uh, guys that you're going to want to target probably um, are going to be everybody that can that can really get it in the air. But nothing too notable in, in terms of like attackability, ground ball to fly ball, batted ball profile. Uh, so you can play all of them. You can play Springer, Bichette, Vladdy. You can play Dalton Varsho as well because we mentioned the reverse split. Ali Kirk, 3,400, really good price tag here. Brandon Belt probably won't even be starting today, but um, 2,600 if he is, you can mix him in in stacks if you play a bunch of Toronto teams. Matt Chapman, fly ball hitter, 4,100, good price. Got into uh, a little bit, seeing the baseball a little bit better now. Um, Witt is 2,800, and against his old team, I think there's a really, really good spot for him. Um, if he's in, he's got second and outfield eligibility, so you can uh, definitely mix him in to your pools as well. But uh, once again, like offense in this game. Atlanta and the Cardinals. Uh, Atlanta, they got to uh, Jake Woodford yesterday. Um a little bit. They probably could have gotten to him a lot more. Um, nevertheless, we have Dylan Dodd on the mound. Don't have any uh, data here in the sheet because he's uh, just coming up from the minors. And he's probably going to have to eat some innings. So we're going to need to see some stuff from him. Uh, 5,300. I'm not touching... I'm not. I'm not touching a lefty against against the Cardinals. Probably not going to be touching many righties against Cardinals either. We saw what they did to... Um, uh, Charlie Morton yesterday. <laughs> They're going to make guys struggle and make guys work. Um, this is Alec Burleson. Didn't have him in the list. But uh, they've got a lot of versatility over here in this lineup. And and guys that can hit both sides of the plate. Goldschmidt will strike out, but he's Paul Goldschmidt. Uh, Nolan Arenado doesn't strike out, and he's Nolan Arenado. So uh, Wilson Contreras behind the plate. Tyler O'Neill, a lot of pop from the right side as well. And they could very well lead off a Tommy Edmond. Um or something at the at the 
at the uh, that ha- has been hitting at the bottom of the lineup. But they may just keep running with Brendan Donovan. He's been great to start the year. Still 4200 for him, so you could play all of the Cardinals once again. A little bit more expensive to get to, but this is a reasonable spot to go attack a, a young arm uh, just coming up from the minors in Atlanta. Very low ownership on the Cardinals, so you can always play them at low ownership. Steven Matz on the other side, 7,500. I'm not touching Steven Matz uh, against the Braves. He's always had uh, power problems to the right side of the plate, and that didn't really change last year. 250 average allowed, 313 Woba. Those those numbers are actually better than their left-handed counterparts. 279 average allowed, 333, excuse me, 334 Woba. However, it's the extra base hits and the homers that really plague Mats from right-handers. 184 ISO and a 1.7 homers per nine. It's the hard contact from the or to the left side of the plate that really suppresses that 279 average and the and the higher woba. So. Uh, really still just want to attack Steven Matz with righties. He'll give it up in the air, and he'll give up a lot of power. So at a neutral ground ball to fly ball, 75% contact rate, not super attackable in terms of, um, you know, he's just going to throw it over the plate and, and good luck because he does still have some swing and miss. 26% strikeout rate, uh, and that's really the only thing that could make him serviceable at 7,500. He's a, he's a fine deep tournament play at very low ownership here. But I think the average projection at about 12 points probably pretty accurate. You can attack the Braves. They struck out at about a 24% clip last season. However, did hit for a 174 ISO, 339 WOBA, and created at a 117 clip against lefties last year. That does include numbers early here in the season for 2023. Uh, but nevertheless, that's probably going to be the same type of numbers that the Braves exhibit uh, because most of their lineup didn't change. It, if anything, they, they made it a little bit better with the addition of Sean Murphy. So um, don't really want – I'm not going to go out of my way to play Steven Matz, but uh, if you land on him at 7,500 and get 5% with the field or something in deep tournaments, I think that's uh, perfectly respectable as well. Okay, Baltimore and uh, Texas. Once again, we don't have a starter announced for Baltimore yet. We'll have to see what they want to do. So we should be able to get through this game pretty quickly. Um, Baltimore still hitting the baseball, and unfortunately they they got kind of stymied yesterday against John Gray. And now, are we going to be able to target some of the Texas um, pitching here with Andrew Heaney once again against the Orioles? Yeah, I think we can. Heaney was actually pretty remarkable last year kind of surprising that the Dodgers let him walk um 35 and a half percent K rate really thought that he was going to stick with LA and they were going to be able to solve his hard contact issues however um they really weren't and I think they found this alarming enough that despite throwing strikes and not walking people the 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 power issues to right-handers uh really didn't subside at all 210 average, which is fine. 314 Woba, which is fine to righties, but a 237 ISO and 20 homers per nine. So a lot of the time, Andrew Heaney, he just pipes the baseball, throws it right over the freaking middle of the plate, and he's only throwing 93 anymore with just a four-seamer slider mix. Doesn't have a changeup that he can throw with any confidence at all. He throws it at 5%, but just about a 6-7 a uh, mile an hour velo delta between the change in the four seamer and he just throws it right over the middle of the plate leads to an 11 percent barrel rate i mean this is like this is bullpen triple a territory um that type of number it is huge and at 8900 that makes him very susceptible to pretty much anybody every time he takes the mound so um despite the very high k rate you, you can play him in tournaments always because he's got this kind of strikeout stuff and even against the Orioles who I don't typically want to be targeting because their lineup is pretty damn good over here uh, they got lefties that can hit lefties and righties that can certainly hit lefties but for the most part Andrew Heaney is going to be a very high variance play uh, all throughout the season at 17 point projection here yeah, yeah, he looks a little bit high. A market, I think, probably a bit high on him. And the high ownership at 17%, um, I don't know. This this feels a little aggressive. But once again, 35.5% K rate, it, like, you can't ignore that. So, And it's not really outsized to either side of the plate. It's 
over 30% to both sides. So um, really, if you want to get off and hedge some of this ownership uh, on Andrew Heaney, if you end up getting a lot or if you just want to take a piece against him, like a Ryan Mountcastle, 4,500, perfectly fine. Um, he's going to be totally ignored today, just 3% ownership that we're showing on him right now. You can play some of these guys. You can play Rutch. He hits from the right side of the plate. Don't really want to go after him with, you know, a 5,500 catcher. But uh, Santander hits from the right side as well. So there's a little bit of susceptibility. Georgie Mateo has some pop. Um, you know, there's a couple of guys in the list that can get to Heaney. But for the most part, I probably side with Heaney here in this matchup. Uh, I'm not sure I want to get 20% or more of him. We'll really have to see how teams sort of flesh out when we start building later. But... Um, you know, I, I really do like the strikeout stuff, and he's one of the few arms that I will consider attacking Baltimore with. Uh, once again, we don't have a starter for Baltimore, so can't really go into too much there. But uh, I like Texas, and I generally like Texas. I'm probably just going to play him because of the prices. So we'll see who they throw. But uh, Corey Seager, 4,500 is an excellent price for him. Nate Lowe, 41, hits both lefties and righties pretty damn well. Adolis Garcia, 4,400, really good price. A lot of pop for him also. So we'll see these ownership numbers just totally noisy. Um, a lot of the, the models, I mean, none of the models have adjusted yet because we don't have a starter. So uh, Marcus Semien, you can play. He's probably overpriced in general, 4,900. But uh, throw these guys in in stacks. If you need to get down to a Josh Young uh, or a Jonah Heim that both hit from the right side of the plate, uh, feel free. They're, they're cheap and they can make the stack happen. So um, some attackable... Yeah, maybe spots on on both sides here. We'll have to see what uh, what the pitching matchup shakes out like. Uh, okay, Detroit and Houston. Probably going to go after Detroit once again. Uh, Hunter Brown got. I I really hate using the term babbipped um, because there's a sort of misconception in the industry that babbip equals luck, and babbip does not equal luck. Um, it, there is an element that can be construed as luck, but. Uh, Suffice to say that it's it's pretty misused across the industry. Nevertheless, um, Hunter Brown gave up a lot of soft contact that ended up falling in for hits. So um, he also got kind of uh, squeezed a little bit as a young pitcher, didn't get a lot of calls that he probably could have and should have um, behind the plate. It was a, a pretty rough... Uh, umpiring crew for him yesterday. So uh, a lot of negative variants that applied to Hunter Brown yesterday. Uh, the stuff is still there, so don't shy away just because he got kind of beat up and, and gave up um, some, gave up a little bit of production to the Tigers. Don't shy away from just playing pretty much everybody against the Tigers. This team is going to be terrible, and uh, at least against lefties last year, they were you know, a little bit better. They didn't strike out nearly as much. So that's really the only thing you'd have to worry about considering Framber on the mound today. But he's got good strikeout stuff, and he's got a, the best ground ball to fly ball ratio in baseball over 4-1. to one. We'll get to him in a sec. But on the mound for the Tigers, at 6,300 and Matt Manning, we're not playing him uh, against the Astros. He only has an 18% aggregate strikeout rate. Through a decent sample, 63 innings last season suppression numbers were fine because he's got a four and five pitch mix that here that he throws decent fastball stuff doesn't throw all that hard but good value for him there really the problem is that he's got a not a very good change up here and a breaking pitch in in the curveball in particular also not very good slider is good so he needs to eliminate probably the curveball go to a four pitch mix here and allow that'll allow him to concentrate on the pitches that really provide him value. So with lack of a good changeup and not a very good curveball, uh, one that doesn't bite and, and really fall off the table, it's going to make him a little bit more susceptible to left-handers. At a neutral ground ball to fly ball and a full 81% contact rate, sub, I mean 57% first pitch strike rate, it's going to make it really difficult for him to navigate patient teams like the Astros. So, um... We're going to go right back to Houston, even though they didn't get after Matt Boyd yesterday. Uh, Matt Boyd, he's got about four ticks more velocity and is historically a hell of a lot better pitcher. I mean, Matt, Matt Manning here is, is pretty young still, um, but still four ticks in velocity is four ticks. And, uh, you know, you can't really fake that. So um, 
with an 18% strikeout rate, you just can't go near him, even at an attractable price tag, 6300 Got to like the Astros once again. You can play Jordan literally every single day. 5800 uh, It's it's fine. Some of the value squeezed out, but he's one of the top five hitters in baseball. So uh, you can play Bregman. He doesn't strike out. Jeremy Pena will, but um, these guys behind, hitting behind him, Josie Abreu, Kyle Tucker, uh, in addition to the the big pop down at the bottom of the lineup. Chaz has kind of retooled his swing a little bit, trying to eke out a little bit more power. David Hensley, a lot of power. Um, they make the strikeout rate of Jeremy Pena basically um, negligible, so to speak. So you can play the Astros definitely. And as of right now, you're seeing them at markedly lower ownership. I like getting to them as a pretty contrarian stack here. Um, we like targeting guys that just can't, throw it by anybody and when they give up a lot of hard contact as Matt Manning does to right-handers um, it that's going to be a, a really really favorable matchup for a team like the Astros who's mostly right-handed heavy but once again Jordan Alvarez and Kyle Tucker um, you play them against uh, lefties and righties doesn't really matter so Framber on the other side uh, you're going to play him seeing massive ownership numbers on him in the early runs these numbers are not going to change and they're probably going to steam uh, in short tournaments, like single entry three max, even 20 max, he's going to be pushing 60 and 70 percent in a lot of stuff, certainly in the higher stakes. Um, it's warranted, but my goodness, like there's variance. You know, as we saw yesterday with Hunter Brown, um, there there's variance when you eat this kind of ownership on a pitcher. We talked about this at the at the opening a little bit. So um, 9900 doesn't mean that I want to fade Framber at all. Like I said, he's got the 23 north of 23 percent strikeout rates, better than league average. Uh, good swinging strike rate, 11 percent, and a 29 percent CSW. I, it's all fine, but what, it's really the the ground ball to fly ball ratio that makes him so difficult. He stays off the barrel. And a four and a half to one ground ball to fly ball is incredible. He's got five pitches here that he uses, less so on the raw four seamer because it's mostly the sinker that provides him all the value. But good curveball, good slider, really good changeup. No power that he's going to allow. So um, even at 50 plus percent ownership for Framber, you can play him. Do not fade him in cash. Don't try to get cute with it or anything, and even in single-entry stuff, you're probably running into a bit of opportunity cost with Framber because he's almost certainly um, just going to tear apart the Tigers here. They're just not going to be able to produce and get the ball in the air, which is really how you can attack Framber. Only slight notable note notable note um, for, the, for Framber here is a semi-elevated walk rate at 8%, and... That's really it's because he throws his so his sinker so hard down in the strike zone early in the count. But his secondary stuff is is plenty good enough to get him out of those kinds of um, those kinds of holes. So don't really worry about that. But uh, you know, get Framber, get plenty of him, and don't worry about fading him because the Tigers stink. Okay, Cleveland and Houston. Um, Shane Bieber on the mound. I like Bieber here, and he's probably my preferred pivot off of Scherzer. Uh, they're seeing similar ownership at about 25% each right now. Um, Shane Bieber actually better against lefties than he is against righties in terms of raw strikeout rate. So the uh, the athletics, they've got a bunch of lefties that they're going to be able to throw at him tonight. Tony Kemp, Jace Peterson hit a bomb last night. Seth Brown hit a bomb last night. Connor Capel had a decent night. Ryan Noda, uh, he's a rookie for them, got his first base hit. Um, they've got some lefties. All of those guys hit from the left side, and really there's not a lot of pop to be scared about from Bieber's standpoint. He's got a 27.5% K rate to lefties, doesn't give up any power, buck 15 ISO and a 222 average allowed, 090 homers per nine to lefties. So um, a little bit of hard contact when he when he can't bury the slider underneath the hands like he really likes to against left-handers, but uh, that's not terribly notable. He stays really off the barrel and, and never walks people. He's always had impeccable control. He throws strikes, and he has ever since he came up. So um, at an aggregate 25% strikeout rate, you can play him uh, certainly against the, the Athletics because they're going to try and platoon a little bit, and the right-handers that they throw at Shane Bieber are not going to be able to do all that much damage all that regularly. So I, I like him a lot at 10-5, and the projection here, maybe looks a tick high anything over 20 i start to balk a little bit but uh, in general i think this is a pretty good play here for bieber today
On the other side, J.P. Sears on the mound for the A's, uh, 18% strikeout rate, 83% contact rate. Doesn't walk people, so he's going to make you hit it, and that's not a situation you want to be getting into against the Cleveland Guardians here. Um, I like them again, and I think they're going to be able to put the ball in play, and this could be a fun team this year, man. Like, Miles Straw, if he can get on base, he's going to be able, he's just, he's going to steal second and third, uh, and he's going to do it all the time. So, Stephen Kwan has speed. He's a pest at the top of the lineup. Takes five pitches per at bat nearly. Um, Ahmed Rosario, he will hit lefties just fine. I mean, Ahmed Rosario is 5,000 today, so let's let's slow down a little bit. But um, Josie Ramirez at 61, like, okay, fine. Um, you're just going to pay it for Josie. It doesn't really matter. Josh Bell will hit from the right side if he's in the lineup today. May DH. Um, Josh Naylor may actually take a seat against the lefty. Who knows? Uh, Andres Jimenez hits lefties just fine. Mike Zanino, plenty of power, 3,800. I, I like this play here tonight uh, because J.P. Sears is not going to be able to throw it by Zanino, and that's really always been um, the big catcher's problem. Is he's, he's just got too much swing and miss. So uh, I like playing some Miles Straw at, at 3,000 to make these, these upper guys a little bit cheaper, like the Josie, uh, Ahmed Rosario, if you end up playing him. Um, anything like that, but they're going to be able to turn the lineup over because they're a very sound fundamental baseball team, and uh, they're going to be fun. As we saw last night, they can they can put up some runs in a hurry. Um, so I would, par- I would play the Guardians, certainly, and no J.P. Sears for me. Uh, Cleveland's just not going to strike out, and he's not going to blow it by anybody. So give me mostly the righties uh, because he's pretty decent against lefties, but, um, you know, small small sample against them you can play pretty much everybody because he's not going to throw it past them okay angels and seattle let's get to the second game of this series josie suarez on the mound for the angels historically he's had a, a bit of a reverse split that's neutralized as we've gotten a larger sample on him um later in his career 7300 interesting price tag uh, probably don't want to target lefties in general against the mariners um, you get into the plus side of the split for Julio, Ty France, Tay Oscar, Gino, AJ Pollock there at a cheap price, 3400 You can play him. He'll probably be hitting in the middle of the lineup. Sam Haggerty is a switch hitter. He shit the bed last night, but at 2000 he's a really good value play. Tom Murphy as well. Um, he did play last night, so we'll, we'll see what they want to do uh, behind the plate. Cal Raleigh. You prefer him mostly against lefties, so they may may give Tom Murphy another start here, but he's 2,600 also. Um, So you can, Cooper Hummel, they also have a a third, quote, catcher uh, on on the roster here who's got a little bit of pop. So plenty of ways to play the Mariners here tonight against Josie Suarez, and he's just got a 22% strikeout rate. Suppression numbers are fine, right at about a 4-0 ERA and XFIP. Um, Not going to walk people, throw strike one. Elevated, slightly elevated, uh, perhaps not on this slate compared to the other, you know, some of the other guys at north of 80%, but the contact rate at 77%, it's notable for sure. 8.5% barrel rate for Josie, so he will give up a little bit of power. Hasn't translated so much into homers necessarily, but uh, a buck 52 ISO and a 164 ISO to lefties and righties respectively. So he's attackable with, with both sides. Uh, a lower strikeout rate to the left side, sub 20%, little bit higher at 23%, about league average uh, against righties. So uh, you can certainly attack him. Really, unfortunately, he's got a massive fly, ground ball to fly ball ratio to f- over 2 to 1 uh, against lefties. So not my favorite to go after him with the lefties. So it's mostly just a natural split here with the righties where he exhibits an 091 ground ball to fly ball ratio giving up balls a little bit more in the air and that's probably not something we want to get involved in with seattle over here um they're expensive you're gonna have to pay for julio gotta pay for ty france 5000 but evidently ty france has stolen base upside now he stole his first base of his career last night stole third uh against a lefty so he, he may try to do that again um and Teoscar, 5,300, also expensive. Makes it a little bit more palatable getting to Geno and, like I mentioned, A.J. Pollock and Sam Haggerty with the Tom Murphy and Cooper Hummel down at the bottom of the list. So it's it's very stackable, um, and I would prefer the, the Mariner side once again. On the other side, Luis Castillo, we like Luis, uh, but there's some variance that comes with him. Even though he's got a high strikeout rate, 27% in aggregate, doesn't really walk people. 
the problem with Luis has always been susceptibility to left-handers, and he's figured that out over the last couple of seasons. But um, if he, it, it's because of the lack of a changeup, right? And if he is, he comes in a little bit three quarters um, with the release point, and if he flattens out with the changeup in the slider, he doesn't really have any of the bite on them. The four seamer, while very good at ninety seven. That's a lot of swing and miss for him, but if he's flat on the uh, the off speed in the breaking pitch, that's going to make it really difficult to navigate um, later in the count, right? So against the Angels, that that's obviously in in Trout and Otani territory. Anthony Rendon um, will actually be serving his uh, suspension. He grabbed a fan or did something crazy uh, on opening day, so he's suspended um, for the next few games. I believe four games. Uh, Hunter Renfo, 4900 This is a ridiculous price tag. I don't know what what we're doing over here at DraftKings, but um, Jake Lamb, if you need to eat some of these uh, more expensive guys like Trout and Otani, if you are stacking the Angels and trying to capitalize on some of the variants with Luis Castillo, uh, you can play a Jake Lamb at $2,000. Um, he's not great. He strikes out a crap load. So in this particular matchup, it's, it's not overly... Um, encouraging i would say but uh otani by far the best play here luis castillo will however um you know trout is a fly ball hitter and, he, and luis castillo has a very high ground ball to fly ball ratio against right handers so that keeps him down in the strike zone and that's not where you want to be against trout so trout is actually a a sneaky good play here um at the price at 6,300, yeah, probably not, but uh, nobody's going to play him. So if you want to play him perhaps on the late slate or something, I think the Angels uh, are pretty intriguing here at elevated price tags and really not a very good matchup overall. But um, we saw last night that the Angels, they got to Kirby too. Luis Castillo markedly better in terms of control um, and and weakness, I suppose, um, than, than George Kirby. Uh, he's got more velo. He's got better control, but still susceptible to to getting torn apart a little bit. I would prefer the Luis, Luis Castillo side, but I'm not sure I want to eat a full 30% ownership on the guy uh, against a really good and you know kind of difficult lineup to navigate over here. Um, you know, you've got uh, Luis Renjifo, who also hits from the left side, who you could throw in at a, at a cheap price tag as well. So would probably um, play both sides of this game once again and minimize my ownership on, on Luis Castillo, even though I like the kid and, you know, he's a good pivot off of the 55% ownership that you're going to see on Fran Braval does. Uh, okay, so last game of the day here, Colorado and the Dodgers. Um, Dodgers got to Colorado. It was mostly against the bullpen. Uh, Ryan Feltner did get tagged, but, um, you know, he was serviceable, had a little bit of swing and miss in him last night, and... That's really what he's going to kind of bring to the table, um, but he's still a young pitcher and and will lose it very often. And against the Dodgers, you just can't can't play that game. Um, everybody got there, and if you had some of the the late slate Dodgers, um, you know they put up a 13 spot on them, I believe. So um, probably not going to see the same type of of offense here uh, tonight. You got Herman Marquez, who maybe. Could be figuring it out a little bit. He was good in his first start. He was bad last year, so that's what the the, the numbers are showing here um, in the chart. I do have the 2023 numbers incorporated here, but um, you know, nevertheless, you know, Herman Marquez at 9100. We're not touching against the Dodgers, given the susceptibility that he showed last season and the power numbers. 273 average allowed, 210 ISO, 1.6 homers per nine to lefties. 250 average, 320 WOBA, 194 ISO. 1.3 homers per nine to righties. Hard contact north of 35% to both sides of the plate. Um, he throws strikes and doesn't really walk people, but just a 19% aggregate strikeout rate for Herman. So until he gets the slider going again, like he had earlier in his career, and starts spotting the four-seamer, really, really struggling with both the four-seamer and the sinker, until he fixes this, I think he's... He, He's definitely made some improvements over the offseason, but until he fixes this and it starts to flush out in the numbers, uh, we're definitely not playing him against the Dodgers on a full slate. So give me, once again, the Dodgers. You could target Freddie. You could play him every day against everybody. Doesn't matter. 
Um, Will Smith probably not at 5,400. Uh, I'm I'm not excited about paying that price tag for him. That's a little that's quite elevated. 47 for Max Muncie. Uh, he's going to strike out a lot, but when he gets going, he's a very streaky hitter. So if he gets going, um, you know, look out because Max Muncie's going to you know, on the late slate. He's you're going to have to pay 5,800 for him and. Uh, he's going to hit two dingers in, in your face anyway, so uh, be prepared for that. J.D. Martinez, 49, elevated price tag here for him as well. James Outman finally seeing a price bump, um, but leave it to the Rockies to, to solve Jason Hayward. He's still 2,000. You could mix him in because having hit a dinger last night and kind of broke it open, break having broke it open, um, broken it open, uh, for the Dodgers against Feltner, um, you, know, you get, he'll probably be in the lineup again. So uh, you could play these guys. They're expensive. You got to pay for them. We're just going to keep their ownership down um, against the Rockies. But honestly, slightly elevated here at seven and a half, eight percent aggregate ownership on the team uh, against Ramon Marquez. I'm not sure that's a a very equitable play here at elevated price tags for all of them. And Urias on the other side. Um, I love this. I I love playing Julio. I love watching him pitch. He's just so calm on the mound. And he's got a really good arsenal. Um, Changeup needs a little bit of work. And his really biggest uh, weakness, I I suppose, is the fastball to lefties, surprisingly. So a a slight reverse split there. But he throws strikes, and he's very calm on the mound. You might see some some pitch clock violations out of Julio, to be honest. He works slower, um, but he's got impeccable control, and he is a good pivot off of both – Scherzer and Bieber at the top. He's only coming in at about 15% ownership right now. I think it's a pretty damn good play, to be quite honest. Uh, certainly a late slate play, and uh, you can play him on the main slate. Even at 10-2, um, you get you can throw him in with a, a Framber if you, if you want to get off of some of the ownership of the top two guys. But overall, we're not going to be playing the Rockies against uh, against Julio. Um the, not on a full slate, at the very least. Really only susceptible very, very slightly. As I mentioned with the fastball, two left-handers will give up uh, a little bit of power in that regard. One and a half homers per nine to lefties, whereas just 1.1 homers per nine to righties. So um, ISO is fine. You know, buck 65 to lefties, 141 to righties. Perfectly perfectly respectable uh, to both sides of the plate. Is a fly ball pitcher, so uh, some of these guys may be able to get the ball in the air. Chris Bryant. Charlie Blackman hits lefties fine. C.J. Crone for sure. Ryan McMahon, interesting play here today. I think he's a little sneaky to maybe get after um, Julio. 4,300, though. I'm not going to target him, you know, go out of my way to play him. Uh, Jerry Profar, if you maybe on the late slate, if you want to stack the Rockies and Urias sees some elevated ownership, go ahead. Uh, at 3,700, he's going to make these other guys uh, a little bit easier to get to. Uh, but that's really it. Mostly Julio and the Dodgers. Um, not not playing Herman Marquez at, at 9100. So that's it for the breakdown. When once again went about an hour here today. I think um, we'll have to you know keep an eye out for what Baltimore is going to do. So quickly we'll go over stacks again. I think you can play um, offense both sides in the Philly Yankees game. Uh, no pitching there for me. No Josh Fleming. You could play a little bit of Washington as filler stacks and deeper tournament stuff. Uh, but once again you're going to get to Tampa. They're going to be chalky. Um, and same thing in the Pittsburgh Boston game. You're going to see ownership come to both of these guys once again, and I think you can play both sides. Um, Mets and Milwaukee prefer the Mets here against Wade Miley, but not overly excited. They're a sneaky stack. Nobody's really going to be on them. If you want to correlate with the Max Scherzer and decrease your exposure versus the rest of the field, um, you know, relative to Scherzer's 25% ownership, I think that's a fine play. Uh, you could hedge a little bit because Scherzer does have a home home run pl- problem uh, with some power power bats from the left side uh, in Milwaukee, like a Ratty Telez, for example. Uh, Toronto and Kansas City should see offense here again. I like both sides of this game. Um, probably, I don't know if I have a favorite. There's a lot of spots to attack here today, but this is definitely one of them. Both Toronto and, and KC should be able to break out here if, as long as Yusei Kikuchi can't figure it out against righties. Uh, you can play Atlanta again, certainly against Steven Matz. Don't want to go out of my way necessarily to target him, but this could be a deep tournament play as well. They weren't very popular yesterday, and you can absolutely get to them, certainly with the Cardinals against a very young arm, Dylan Dodd. Don't have any data on him, so we're going to have to... Um, 
you know, see how that plays out. But uh, definitely playable offense on both sides here as well. Don't really want to target Baltimore against Andrew Heaney. You can play Andrew, um, you know, on the mound. He's got a 35 and a half percent K rate, and that's good to get. That's going to play against everybody. So, uh, like Texas in general, just because of the pricing, even though we have no idea who uh, who Baltimore's throwing yet. Uh, not touching Detroit once again. Framber mega chalk, so you're going to have to figure out how to navigate that. But you can play Houston bats as well. Maybe get off of some of that ownership. Um, like Bieber a lot, and do not like Oakland. Um, do not like JP Sears and like Cleveland a lot. So there you go. Uh, Angels and Seattle, you can play both sides offensively in this game. Mostly Luis Castillo, though, for me. Um, if you do want to get off of some of the Castillo ownership on the, on a main slate or something, play the Angels on the late slate. I think that's fine. And uh, no Rockies for me here tonight. Uh, really, really like Julio Urias. Uh, you can play him in cash tonight if you want, and I think that's a pretty damn good play. Um, certainly get to the Dodgers if you, if you want to, uh, but they're expensive. You're going to have to pay for them. Um, so that's it. We got projections up, as I mentioned. Uh, they're up on the site. Should be pushed to SaberSim as well, and we'll have updates all throughout the day, so keep an eye out for that and whoever uh, Baltimore is going to be throwing on the mound. Uh, good luck, guys.